Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. There's a blog post titled, Don't Let the Internet Dupe You, Event Sourcing is Hard. It's been getting a lot of attention, but unfortunately, it conflates both event sourcing and event-driven architecture. Event sourcing is about using events as state. Event-driven architecture is about using events to communicate with other service boundaries. I'm gonna go over this blog post to hopefully clarify the differences between the two. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So this is the blog post in question. I'll have a link in the description, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight some key points so that I can add some clarity to what they're actually talking about. Because in some cases, as the title says, they're talking about event sourcing here, but it's really not event sourcing that they're talking about in a large portion of this. So let's get started. So this first part is saying how the core selling point of event sourcing is largely an anti-pattern. Why they're saying that is they're saying that this particular diagram here, which is often shown when talking about event sourcing, but not in my videos, because you will not see this in mine, is showing all these different services which are publishing and consuming events from an event log or an event stream. And where I suspect this kind of diagram is often shown is when referring to using event sourcing when uh, using something like Apache Kafka. And the way, reason I say that is because lower down here, they make mention of uh, you wouldn't let two separate services reach directly into each other's data storage when not event sourcing. Now, this is the thing is that, again, event sourcing is about state and how you record state. An event-driven architecture and using something like an event log is how you want to communicate between services. So let's clarify what event sourcing is and why I'm saying it relates to how you record state. Is let's say we're recording current state, how most people typically do in a relational database or a document store. We have this product where we have a SKU, say some quantity on hand when we last received and when we last shipped it. So this is what represents current state. With event sourcing, however, we're recording a series of events for a particular unique aggregate um, of all the things that have occurred that can get us to current state. So the events themselves are what we're recording as state. So for example, if we have an event that is we receive product of quantity 10 on a particular date, we receive more product of another quantity. So now we technically, our current state is 15 and maybe we ship some product. So now we're down to nine. And then we did an inventory adjustment where we added 50 more because we magically found some in the warehouse. So now we're at 59. You'll have each unique aggregate have its own event stream is what it's often called. So for example, for our product SKU ABC123, it has an event stream, which are all the events that occurred for it. And then a separate product entirely of YYZ897 has its own event stream. If you want more on what event sourcing actually is and some of the patterns around it, check out my playlist on event sourcing. But the key here is event sourcing is about how you record state. Now in event driven architecture, you're gonna be using a message broker or in the example of this blog post, an event log to communicate with other boundaries. So that means that as it was applying, you wouldn't have another service go and reach to another uh, systems database. And that's because each service decides how it records state. That mean that we could have one boundary here that is using event sourcing and that is using an event store, but maybe another boundary is just using relational database. Maybe another service boundary is using a, a document DB of some sort. How they persist and how they maintain state is completely up to them. You aren't going directly to their database. What you're using event log for or, an event, or a message broker is to then publish events, but you can be publishing events and using event uh, driven architecture without doing event sourcing. This middle service boundary here, if it's using a relational database, it can still publish and consume events. It doesn't need to be doing event sourcing. So again, event-driven architecture is about using events on how you communicate with other service boundaries. So jumping back to this blog post, this is exactly describing what I'm talking about. And that's why they're confused is that it says under normal development flows, you operate within the safe, cozy little walls that make up your service. You're free to make choices about implementation and storage. And then when you're ready, deal with how those things get exposed to the outside world. Exactly what I'm referring to, because you're conflating event sourcing and event driven architecture together. That's why they're thinking this. But again, if you if they're completely separate, which they are, 
you are in the zone of being defined within your own service boundary about how you record state, and then you decide what events you wanna to publish to that event log or to that message broker. So if we go back to this diagram, now you can see where it goes wrong, where it's using persistence of an event stream as also a way of communicating with other services. Those are two separate orthogonal concerns. So the second point in this post is that the upstart costs are large. So it's kind of mentioning that you're probably gonna build the core components from scratch. Frameworks in this area tend to be heavyweight, overly prescriptive, and inflexible in terms of tech stack. Now, again, I don't know if they're conflating what side of the equation they're talking about. Are they talking about event sourcing or event-driven architecture? If we're talking about event-driven architecture, you will use a library. Don't go down the road of building your own. So don't go down this road of building your own. Why? Because once you get into messaging, there's a lot of messaging patterns that you'll realize you'll need. And messaging libraries, out of the box, apply those patterns for you. So don't use the SDK directly. Use a messaging library because it's going to give you things like the outbox pattern, process managers, uh, fault tolerance for retries and dead letter queues. Use a messaging library. Now on the event sourcing side of things, how you want to store your events to the event store that you're using isn't overly complicated. And you don't need to build a library or a framework around this. It's simply building a repository, like I've showed in other of my videos, to persist your events, use optimistic concurrency. I even showed how to do snapshots and creating a separate stream for snapshots. So you don't really need a framework and you don't need a library for how you're gonna do event sourcing and how you're persisting your events. So the second part of this article is that event sourcing needs the UI side to play along, specifically stating how you wanna have a task-based UI. And I've done videos about this. And the reason why, but this applies to both event sourcing and how you're recording state and event-driven architecture of how you're publishing events because there's different types of events. There are events that you can be using for workflow or long running process, business processes that you're having other services be a part of that workflow. And those are gonna be driven by business events or business concepts, things that are actually happening. But there's also this other side of it, if you're creating CRUD based UIs that you're gonna be publishing CRUD type events. So things like a product was created or kind of property based where product name was changed or updated. These are generally used for kind of data propagation between other services. So services have kind of a local cache. So I've done, again, videos about this, about the differences between events. But the thing is, is yes, a task-based UI will end up deriving more behavioral type events than a CRUD-based UI will. But this isn't necessarily about event sourcing or event-driven architecture. It ultimately leads to how you're gonna create events in either scenario. So the next part of this is potentially you'll be building two entirely different systems along each other. Talking about that you don't event source everywhere and that figuring out where and when to draw those architectural boundaries through your system is quite tough in practice. So when this, it's kind of not an either or, but again, you got to distinguish whether we're talking about state or communication with other services. Each boundary, you can decide how you want to record state, as I mentioned before. Oftentimes I find that more in a supporting role, a, just a boundary that's more in a supporting role for kind of referential data that you need, maybe CRUD fits well. Um, and you don't need to event source. You don't need to record state that way. In more of the core of your domain, maybe you do want to record state that way. But again, we're talking about state. We're not talking about how you're communicating with other boundaries via events. So if we're talking about you have CRUD, you're likely, if you want to communicate those changes with other boundaries, you're likely going to create cruddy events like I was talking about. But maybe you're doing a task-driven UI, but you're not event sourcing, so you're still communicating and publishing events that are gonna be more specific to the behaviors of things that have actually happened. And maybe that's appropriate in those places. If you're using event sourcing and you're creating a task-based UI, that's how you're recording those. But that doesn't mean necessarily that you're publishing those same type of events. I've posted another video about this before of the difference between a domain events and integration events and where you should use integration events and maybe where it's applicable. Maybe you can publish domain events that you are event sourcing, that you are storing as state. But a lot of that comes down to how stable those business concepts are of those events. So yes, defining service boundaries is really difficult. I often say that it's one of the most important things to do, yet it's really hard to get quote unquote somewhat right. But again, differentiate here between how we record state and how we communicate with events to other service boundaries. All right, so next up we have past system states from the audit log will often have fidelity problems. 
And it kind of mentions, oh, so these events are no longer relevant at all situation. Now, this is an interesting one because if you're talking about event sourcing, then that particular concern is confined within that service boundary that's doing the event sourcing. You're going to have separate concerns of if you want a version, when you're talking about uh, event-driven architecture and publishing that event that other uh, boundaries are consuming. So they're completely different concerns and you can version them completely differently. Now, having said that about the no longer relevant part, under both circumstances of event sourcing and event-driven architecture, is how are you defining these events? I most often see this when developers are defining what the events are, and they're based on more technical concerns rather than actual business concepts or behaviors that are actually happening in the system. As I mentioned, if you're basing these off actual business concepts and stable business concepts, they're not gonna change that often. All right, so lastly we have, you'll deal with materialization lag. And this is talking specifically about event sourcing when you're creating a projection, which is a read model from your event stream, and you're using that read model in your UI. So there can be kind of a, a lag between what your event stream is, which your point of truth, and what your read model is, or what you're showing in your UI. Now, I mentioned this in other videos, is that it's a fair concern, but it's how you're actually dealing with it. And most oftentimes, people have this issue, not all the time, but most of the time, when they're developing CRUD-based UIs, and the user has the expectation because of the workflow that they're saving state of some sort and that you're immediately going to read your write and it's going to be up to date. And if you kind of do that and it's not, users are throwing up their hands saying, well, it didn't save. Well, that's just because you're doing it and you're, you're developing your application in a way that you're expecting to be able to read your write when there is lag there. So a lot of this, again, goes back to user expectations and how you're making that expectation and how you're actually creating your UI in a task-based way. So if you move out from CRUD and you move more to waste, uh, towards task-based and don't expect to read your write, things change a lot here. This isn't unique to event sourcing though. You're under the same type of situation if you're using a read replica that has a lag, meaning you won't be able to read from your write. This blog post had a lot of valid points and concerns. The issue is, is that it's directing them specifically at event sourcing when it's really conflating event sourcing and event-driven architecture. Hopefully I illustrated that event sourcing is about using events for state. Event-driven architecture is using events to communicate with other service boundaries. That's not to say that event-driven architecture and event sourcing don't have their difficulties, they do. But as mentioned in this post, don't conflate the two because you're talking about two different concepts that are completely orthogonal from each other. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.